philosopher René Descartes, we enter an entirely new epoch in the history of philosophy. I'd mentioned previously how the pre-Socratics set a problematic, as it were, for the ancient world, for the Greeks and after them, uh, the great Christian thinkers, how they set up issues and problems. Descartes does that for the modern period. He is indeed the father of modern philosophy. We'll find that in modern philosophy, argument becomes far less dialectical, and by dialectical I mean intuitive, commonsensical, and far more formal. So a far greater sense of logical precision, of argumentative accuracy. And in large part, that's a result of the scientific revolution. And Descartes was an important part of the scientific revolution. Uh, those of you, I'm sure, who've done any higher uh, mathematics have studied his work. Analytic geometry is, in fact, the child of Descartes. You studied the Cartesian coordinate system. It's the same fellow. He also read the works of Galileo, Copernicus. He knew of all the cosmological speculation of his time. In other words, we're looking at a figure who's one of the fathers of modern science and modern philosophy. And the key to his modern philosophy is the, temp the attempt to take that same scientific precision, accuracy, sensibility, and a use it to approach metaphysical problems and philosophical problems. Now, I want to pause for a minute to talk about modernity itself and philosophy. Why, or what, rather, do we mean when we say philosophy has been made modern? A lot of different senses, but the most obvious historical sense is it comes on the heel of the Renaissance. What Renaissance means is rebirth. And what it was, was the rebirth of classical learning of the greats that you've previously heard of, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. What separates modern philosophy, then, from the epoch that precedes it, the Renaissance, is the sense that we no longer have to look over our shoulders at the greats of the past. That we have the analytic and cognitive tools to go beyond them, to create new philosophies, to create a new understanding of the universe, far superior to theirs. And I can't stress enough how much this is a reflection of a new, growing sense of confidence within the West, particularly within the Western speculative tradition. That no longer need we be live in the shadow of Aristotle, the shadow of Augustine, the shadow, shadow of Plato. We have new things to say that may be more important, more accurate, and more true than anything they had to say before. So that is the sense in which Descartes is the father of modern philosophy. He specifically refused to footnote anything in his text to Plato, Aristotle, any figure we've looked at. He refused because he said, if you do that, what is the nature of your argument? You're arguing from authority, right? You're saying, well, I believe X because, well, Plato said X, and Plato's a real smart guy, therefore X must be the case. The scientific conception of philosophy is that whatever I believe, I should be able to scientifically and logically prove. Authority has no place in such disputation. And that is the project that Descartes attempts to pursue. But he goes beyond that. In fact, he argues that we have to go beyond merely probabilistic arguments. But if we're to have a truly scientific philosophy, it must be absolutely certain. It must be built on the most firm foundations possible. It must, in other words, be completely proven and indisputable. That, I'm, I would argue, is a rather tough bill to fill, as it were. That's a tough task to, to try and complete. And I must confess, Descartes did not entirely do that. One of the fundamental problems of philosophy is ethics, and Descartes never quite got around to it. But he made an excellent start, a start which has influenced every thinker since. In so many ways, at least for the next three centuries, philosophers are attempting to deal with the issues Descartes 
as laid down. And they're trying to do them in terms of the way Descartes framed questions. Okay, then the question becomes, how do we build philosophy on a completely certain foundation? And that raises the question of method. We must begin with a method which can only produce truth, which can only produce logically correct arguments, which can only produce complete persuasion. And that, of course, is the famous Cartesian method. And we're going to look at that method, and we're going to look at the way he uses it, once he's established it, to create his metaphysic, a metaphysic which is most commonly referred to as mind-body dualism. Now, the method comprised four different components, or steps. The first step is what he called systematic doubt. We must reject as false, provisionally at least, every single proposition which is only probable. No matter how obvious it may seem, if we cannot prove it, if it's not entirely certain and indubitable, and we, if we can't prove it's indubitable, we must, provisionally at least, reject it as false. So we begin only with that which can absolutely and certainly be claimed to be true. And that is the philosophical starting point. Given that, when you find something which you know absolutely, and it comprises, let's say, a problem or issue, you have to, as he says, break it down, chop it up. What we call, and in fact, what ancient Greeks called as well, analysis. Right? Analysis is simply that. You take a large-scale problem and you break it down into its smallest component parts. So we begin with systematic doubt and then move forward to analysis. Once you have analysis, then you enter the process of rational reconstruction. A problem has been broken down into its bits. Now it must be reconstructed into its totality, into its unity, into its whole. And that must be done we call that process synthesis, by the way, that must be done logically through proof. And in fact, to ensure that such proofs are, log are logical, Descartes insists that you don't do them intuitive, intuitively. Don't do them in your mind. Don't talk about them. Write them down. Write them down just as you would a proof in Euclidean geometry. And again, I, we must remember Descartes is a pioneer in modern analytic geometry. That is his model of rational inquiry. And what we have in geometry, I think we can fairly claim, is absolute certainty. We must take that method and apply it to metaphysical issues. So then, with those four steps, systematic doubt, analysis, synthesis, and careful recapitulation of our arguments, we have the Cartesian method. Well, let's then begin with his systematic doubt. Now, this is a difficult concept for most people who have not studied philosophy to, to make much sense of. I mean, we all can think of things we can doubt, right, in a very ordinary sort of sense. I, for one, have never been to Japan. I've seen pictures of it, I've heard people talk about it, but I've never been there. In an obvious sense, I can doubt the existence of Japan. I mean, everybody in the world may be part of some huge conspiracy that endeavors to convince me that there's really this place on the other side of the world, when in fact there's not. That's possible. Similarly, I can doubt the existence of Neptune. I've never seen it. I've seen maps, but people could be lying to me. Stranger things have been known to happen. Okay, that's an intuitive sense of doubt. But Descartes says that's not enough. There's more than that that you can doubt. Right? You can doubt, for example, that you had for breakfast what you had for breakfast yesterday. How so? Well, sometimes you dream, don't you? Maybe you dreamed you had breakfast. How can you tell the difference? Can you prove that you actually had that breakfast? Maybe, and maybe not. What do you only have as certainty? What is the only thing which you're actually aware of? And here is Descartes' great innovation. The only thing you're really aware of is, as it were, a show between your ears. Right? Consider it. All of what you Im are immediately apprehend are cognitive states, are representations. And then the question becomes, representations of what? Okay, he then goes into a famous argument that we can even doubt our own material, physical existence. <clears throat> and 
and he employs a method which is quite logical and sensible. Um, what I'm going to offer you is a sort of modern version of it. It's logically identical, but it's simply jazzed up in a form which, at least for, for college students, is far more intuitive and obvious to them. Descartes makes reference to an evil genie. I'm going to talk about a mad scientist. Descartes says, in effect, imagine if you will, that there exists this crazy, mad, evil scientist. He's brilliant. A little demented, but brilliant. He's brilliant in two particular fields. One, neurology. He has mapped out all of your neural states, all of your neurochemical simulations in your brain, the stimulation of your C fibers. He knows exactly which ones correspond to each of your sensual apprehensions, each of the moments in that show between your ears that you're aware of. Not only is he able to do that, he's also developed a super smart computer. He's a great cybernetic expert. And the super smart computer can instantaneously collate each of your neural states, each of perhaps your drives that are going on in your brain with the, the correct physical analog that you should experience in a normal day or in, 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 in any normal setting. But there's more to it than that. He's also found a way of taking brains, keeping them alive, and putting them in a large vat of nutrient solution that keeps them alive, sustains them. So he's got this huge vat full of brains in a nutrient solution. And what he does is, and this is dastardly as can be, he connects those brains, all of the neuro neural synapses, to that super smart computer. And he feeds them datum. In other words, he, he, says, he tells that super smart computer to feed to the brain the sense datum that it's actually in a body and not in a vat. So it has all the sense datum of, say, sitting in a chair. And it's actually sent the neural stimulation of the feeling of the texture of a hard chair under your uh, legs, the feeling of a hard back behind you, the feeling of, of a dark black uh, floor underneath your feet. But he's even more insidious than that. He tempts you with horrible images. In other words, he actually makes you think you're sitting in a lecture room and that there's some crazy guy up on a podium walking back and forth, telling you that you're a brain in a vat. In short, the question Descartes asks is, to each of you, how do you know you're really in this room? How do you know I'm really talking to you? How do you know you're not just a brain in a vat being sent electrical stimulations into your neural structure, which simulate all the physical analogs of a professor walking back and forth on a podium talking about brains in a vat? Think about that for a minute. That's a rather difficult problem. That, incidentally, is the problem of modern skepticism. How do we know we're really here? We could be dreaming, we could be brains in a vat. Okay. Well, Descartes thinks for a long time, how am I going to think myself out of this vat? I don't want to be in a vat. How do I even know I exist? And then he comes up with an answer. He says, you know, I doubt my physical existence. I doubt your physical existence. Who knows? Maybe I'm the only brain in the vat. Maybe I'm not even a brain. Maybe there's not even any vat. But you know, there's one thing that occurs to him. As I doubt, I doubt. There must be something having the cognitive state of doubt. Therefore, there is something that exists. A doubting subject. And we call that doubting subject I. So Descartes can therefore state categorically, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. It's a logical necessity. It is impossible to contradict that. So one thing we can each and all be certain of, absolutely, a priori, and logically, that you exist as long as you think. What about everyone else? Perhaps you're the only thinking thing in the universe. Well, he says, let's step back for a minute. We have one sentence which we know absolutely is true. I think, therefore I am. Well, 
Since we have a true sentence, let's examine it carefully and see what is it about that sentence that marks it off as true. And he thinks about it and he says, it's quite obvious. I intuitively apprehend it in a clear and distinct fashion. I have many mental representations. Lots of things go on in that show between my ears. Lots of ideas pass my mind. But this one is so clear and distinct, so intuitively obvious that I can't reject it. And we have here the birth of the Cartesian epistemology, an epistemology of clear and distinct ideas. And again, think yourself back into Descartes' position, and it should be actually quite similar to your own position. We have not moved very far beyond the Cartesian problematic. It's still a modern problematic. When you get representations of various uh, cognitive states, various things going on in that show between your ears, how do you know which are true and which are false? How do you know that when you see, a, uh, let's say, a hallucination or a mirage, it's just that? He says, well, in a certain sense, Mirages and dreams are sort of fuzzy and vague. But the things which you know actually ac accurately represent are clear and distinct. Um, a modern philosopher by the name of Richard Rorty has given a very nice metaphor for this. He says, what the Cartesian problem is sort of like, the mind is this big mirror. And it mirrors everything that's going on outside of it. Some of the reflections, of course, are simply of appearance and not of reality. How do we tell the difference? Well, we're sort of in the brain, or in the mind as it were, looking at the mirror. And some of the reflections in the mirror are clear and distinct, and some of them are fuzzy. The clear and distinct ones are obviously more accurate representations than the others. This doctrine of the cogito not only has therefore an important epistemological uh, basis to it, it's also been an important insight for other philosophic movements. Uh, in subsequent lectures, we'll be talking about existentialism. Many existentialists feel Descartes' cogito was the very first existential doctrine. Now, before we go any farther, we have to be clear. What exactly is a thinking thing or mind? And he's quite clear. It's not what previous philosophers have talked about. Don't confuse the mind with the soul. In fact, he has a wonderful statement where he says, <clears throat> I'm not some subtle air infused into these members, right? The pre-Socratic notion of the soul. Not a wind, not a fire, not a vapor, not a breath. Nothing that I imagine to myself, for I have supposed all these to be nothing. What then is a mind? What are its fundamental properties? And he states, But what then am I? A thing that thinks. What is that? A thing that doubts, understands, affirms, denies, wills refuses, and which also imagines and senses. That is the modern notion of mind. No one had ever expressed that before René Descartes, one of the fundamental breakthroughs in Western speculation. So we have the certainty of our mind's existence, and we know that all the clear and distinct ideas that pass in the mind are true. Let's now examine some of those clear and distinct ideas. Are there any others? Do you not intuitively apprehend geometrical proofs in a clear and distinct way? Do you not, in fact, intuitively apprehend logic in a clear and distinct way? Therefore, we can know, even if our bodies don't exist, even if we really are just brains in a vat, that the proofs of geometry are true and that logic is true. But there's one other idea that we have that Descartes finds very interesting. Each of us know how to use a three-letter word, God. Each of us have a concept of God. Where did that come from, Descartes asks. He says, well, could it come from your imagination? But how so? How can you imagine what you've never experienced? Therefore, perhaps the idea of God is something imprinted on us from outside, sort of the way an artist signs a, a painting. The concept of God comes from our creator. And he offers several proofs for the existence of God, which he considers quite logical. The most famous of which is the ontological argument. He says, let's just be purely analytic. Suspend belief for a minute in God and just talk about what the notion or concept of God includes. God could be defined as a perfect being. So now let's talk about what would be the properties of such a perfect being. Undoubtedly would be omniscient, omnipotent, unchanging, 
wise. You've got all those properties, keep them in your mind. And now he asks you the following question. Okay, now we're talking about a perfect being with all those properties. Which would be more perfect, if it existed or if it didn't exist? If it existed, obviously. Therefore, existence is part of the very concept of God. If you can have the concept of God, that in itself is a logical proof that God must exist. Elsewise, where did you have the concept? He offers another proof in, uh, in favor of God. He says, well, you have an idea of God that includes perfection. Any idea you have must have as much reality as whatever it is that caused it. Have you ever experienced anything perfect? Only something perfect could cause the idea of perfection. And what would we call something perfect? Three-letter word, God. Now, would it make sense for God, a perfect being, to be a liar? No. Why would it deceive? That's a fault, a vice. Therefore, we can say with certainty that God is no deceiver. He doesn't lie to us. And since we perceive a world around us, there's no reason to assume that God is an evil scientist playing games with our neural structures. There really is a world out there. And we can know it because we know that God exists as a logical concept as an absolutely provable entity. And since God is no deceiver, we can then begin to trust that the unextended world exists. Now I want to turn to the establishment of the mind-body dualism. Descartes says, uh, in accordance with, in fact, the logical principle of identity, that two things are identical, are the same, if and only if they share every and all properties. If there's any property they don't share, therefore, they're not the same thing. And that's how we individuate entities in the world. But he points out, you can doubt the existence of your body, can't you? Right? It's possible that you're a brain in a vat. But you cannot doubt the existence of your own mind. Right? So therefore, we can logically prove that your mind is not the same as your body. Do you all follow that? Great. Mind is a completely distinct entity from body. And in fact, if we choose to look at it, we'll see that they have very different properties. Descartes says, what are the properties of bodies? They're extended. What does that mean? Well, for us, I think the best analog would be they're spatio-temporal. They have volume. And that, of course, is an important breakthrough. Because instead of the old substantialist notion of body, that it's, it's an Urstoff or something like that, he points out that what physics really talks about is the spatiotemporal. That's the modern way of conceiving of the physical. It's that which takes up space and exists in time. But is the mind extended? How big is your mind? I hope I have as large a mind as you do. Moreover, all physically extended things can be divided, right? We could take this lectern here and cut it in half. Tell me, what would it be like to have half a mind? <coughs> or a quarter mind? You ever looked at a quarter of a concept? How about three-eighths of a notion? Right? The point is, minds are not spatiotemporal. They correspond to a completely distinct ontological realm. They're unextended. They're undetermined by material phenomena. And they're indivisible. We can't cut out half your mind, and we can't have three-quarters of an idea. So, we have a universe with two substances, right? Mind and body. And that, I would argue, is the modern worldview. Now, as I say this, I should point something out. I want to point something out. First of all, historically, this may seem like a very similar doctrine to something you've seen before, right? Plato's ontological dualism, the realm of ideas and the realm of material things. And indeed, at first, that looks to be extremely similar. Where would ideas fit except for in the mind? But if we return to those properties that distinguish mind for Descartes, we see there's a subtle difference. What made up the ideas for Plato were universals. Right? We're abstract entities. For Descartes, they're phenomenal states. They're the sorts of things of which you have an immediate awareness in all of your conscious life. That's 
the mind. And again, I must stress, no one had ever thought of mind or created mind in that way. It's a real replacement for soul. Having established this, I think, path-breaking doctrine, I want to suggest ways in which, in fact, it's kind of problematic. It's a very careful logical proof. But it raised issues that Descartes was perhaps not aware of, but which subsequent Cartesians had to deal with. First of all, if mind and body are two completely distinct realms, how can they possibly interact? Right? Minds are intentional states. Bodies are physically efficiently caused. How does a physical thing, which has nothing in common with a mental thing, cause a mental state? And yet, we all seem to believe somehow that our mental states affect our physical being. I can, if I choose and will, to lift my arm, lift my arm. How then do we explain the fact that our mental states seem to correspond to our physical motions? How does mind interact with body? Descartes, when it was posed to him by Thomas Hobbes, came up with, unfortunately, a most embarrassing doctrine. He said, well, in the center of your brain is the, is the uh, pineal gland, or excuse me, the pituitary gland. And he says, well, what happens is you get sensual motion in bodies, which are purely atoms in the void, extended things with purely mathematical properties, and they send sort of electrical signals up to the pineal gland, and that's where your soul's hanging out, or excuse me, your mind is hanging out in your pineal gland, and sort of, somehow or other, they push against it. Now, it's very difficult to push against a non-spatial thing, if you've ever tried it. It's very difficult to imagine how a non-extended substance can fit in something like a pineal or pituitary gland. But nonetheless, that was his view. Subsequent to him, uh, other Cartesians attempted to come up with far more, how would we say, rational explanations of the doctrine? The most famous of which was called parallelism. Think of the universe with two distinct realms as two big clocks, perfectly timed to each other by God. So as each thing happens in the physical world, entirely unconnected to it, but exactly parallel to it, things occur in your phenomenal or conscious states. Another view was called occasionalism very much like parallelism, but when the parallels had to occur, occur, God took the occasion to make sure you had the right cognitive state. Okay, that's one sense in which it's problematic. There's another sense. For all of his logic and brilliance, it's a completely bogus proof. And I wanted to spend some time to try and show you, in fact, how it is bogus on purely logical grounds. The key is that mind is, is undoubtable and body is doubtable. The question is, what kind of a property is doubtability? Modern Cartesian analytic philosophy has taught us, in fact, since Descartes' time, that states of belief and doubt are what are called referentially opaque. That is to say, what we doubt and, belief and, be and believe are not things, but sentences. In other words, I, I don't doubt this lectern, I doubt the sentence that this lectern exists. I don't doubt this coffee cup, though I may doubt the sentence that this coffee cup exists. Okay, that's an extremely abstract argument. It can very often take uh, me, at least, about an hour and a half to explain it to people. But I want to give you an intuitive example, which is quite common in logic which can illustrate it, an example of referential opacity. Suppose that doubtability and belief statements were not referentially opaque. If that was so, the following would be a completely legitimate proof. Take a piece of paper and write the following words. Tigers eat meat. Below that, write the sentence. Tiger is a five-letter word. Got those two? Starting to figure out what the inference is? 
Five letter words eat meat. Circle gets the square. Absolutely. It's a completely logical proof. So therefore, we know that five letter words go around eating meat. They're carnivores. All right. How do we show that this is a bogus proof? We point out tigers here eat meat. This word refers to an object. In the second sentence, tiger has to be quoted. It doesn't refer to an object at all. It refers to a string of symbols. That's what we mean by referential opacity, that the reference is not to the object that the word normally gestures at, but rather to the string of symbols itself. Every time you use doubt and belief, what follows should be quoted. And that's indicated in, in normal English grammar by the word that. I doubt that the body exists. You can always replace, replace the word that with quotations around the following words and put it before the other expression. I doubt that the body exists. Quote, the body exists, end quote, is doubtable. That's the synonymy. What does Descartes do? He pretends the quotation marks aren't there and goes on. That's still a pretty abstract argument, so I'm going to try and give it to you on a more intuitive level, a common sense everyday example. Uh, the one I'm going to draw from, uh, a friend of mine told me, he claimed to have gotten it from a philosopher named Nelson Goodman. It's a story that goes something like this. When I was a kid, my dad used to own a liquor store. And, you know, it was a decent life. Every Friday we'd get together with his family, his three brothers and his parents. Um, but on Tuesdays, this crazy lady, the local drunk, would come in. We'll call her Crazy Sally. She'd come in, she'd be all disheveled and, you know, at loose ends. And come in and say, can I have a bottle of Mad Dog 2020? And, you know, my dad was a nice guy. He used to give Crazy Sally a bottle of Mad Dog 2020 on the house. Because she was the neighborhood drunk and she was a very nice lady. And, in fact, she was always very nice to me. I could not doubt the existence of Crazy Sally, could I? I mean, she was there every Tuesday, like clockwork, for Mad Dog 2020. However, I did doubt the existence of my Aunt Sally. But it turns out, Sally was the black sheep of the family. Never showed up to the family get-togethers, and they kept it a secret from me. They were afraid I'd be scandalized. And therefore, if Descartes is right, Sally can't be my aunt. But in fact, she was, or at least so the story goes. Okay? So we can see that this is, as it were, logically a bogus proof. But can we stop there and say, okay, it was a bogus proof, dopey idea, mind and body aren't distinct. No, I think the real point, the real critical payoff is to notice something. Descartes is a, was a brilliant thinker. I don't think he was aware of this problem. This disquotational issue and referential opacity is one of the really modern analytic concepts that we've developed in the last 120 years or so. But I think he probably did realize that the proof may have been a little bit shaky. And the question is not to say, well, how could he have made such a leap? But rather to see, what is he really trying to do? He has the intuition that there's something different in him than in a piece of wood. And yet it can't be the physical nature of it, because they're both made of the same thing, atoms. Right? They're both extended things with magnitude and mass. That's all that they are. Those are the primary qualities. From them arise in us, centrally, things like colors and textures, but those aren't in the things themselves. The things are purely physical entities, as the modern physicists would argue. And he's trying to prove somehow, to cash that intuition in, that somehow I'm different than a dog, than a cat, that there's something different than, in me than a monkey. And I think we all have that intuition. It would be absurd not to. The lesson to draw is how difficult it is to prove it. Not that it can't be proven. I'm not sure it can't be proven. But I am sure that Descartes didn't succeed because it's a very difficult thing to prove. How does one show that there is a, a huge gap between ourselves and physical phenomena? And let me be clear about Descartes' view of physical things. He's not a teleologist. He entirely rejected the Aristotelian tradition. It's a modern scientific conception. As Descartes tells us, if I could get my organic chemistry to a more advanced level and could design right a mechanical organically designed monkey and wind it up and get it going 
you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that and what you find in the environment. A monkey and any animal is like a machine. It has no will, it has no soul, it's simply matter in motion caused by instinctual reactions which are genetically programmed. He didn't know about genes, but he had that sort of conception, a mechanistic conception of material things. Am I like that? I mean, do I get wound up before I come out here and then just pace back and forth and... Am I a mindless entity that just vocalizes? None of us experience our life that way. And so we try to cash it in, in proofs. So again, I, I don't want to suggest that uh, Descartes was a dope. He wasn't. He was a brilliant man. I don't want to suggest that mind-body dualism is dopey. I want to suggest that it's one of the fundamentally modern problematics, the issues of somehow trying to distinguish the mind from the body. What is distinct about our mental cognitive states and the world around us? And now I want to mention what the implications of it are. Descartes is trying to uh, respond to the problem of skepticism and solipsism, right? Solipsism is the argument that, how do you know you're not, since we, you're all certain you're there, how do you know that there's anyone else there? How do you know, like the brain in the vat, that you're not being sent images of everyone around you, and that in fact you're not the only one in the entire universe? Kind of lonely, but entirely logically plausible. And that's one of the problems that Descartes resolves by positing God, in fact, trying to prove the existence of God. The other problem is skepticism. How can we prove that we have knowledge? And that's why he comes up with the method for certainty. Much to his chagrin, or perhaps not to his chagrin, I don't think he was aware of it, what he really did was transform the nature of skepticism. What he pointed out for the first time, which the Greeks with their hylomorphic notions were not aware of, was that all we are immediately aware of is a show between our ears, is a series of purely mental representations. It is, as it were, a veil of ideas. Whereas in the previous period, skepticism had uh, devolved around the senses. How do I know my senses are accurate? Here the problem becomes, how do I know my ideas accurately represent the things in the world in and of themselves? And in many cases, they don't. I mean, I have the idea of, say, several members of the audience as of a particular uh, color, a particular um, uh, um, texture, perhaps. If I went up and smelled you, did a little olfactory inspe inspection, perhaps a little odor. Um, certainly, under these bright lights would be understandable. And the point is, in that case, We can't be certain. All I have is, as it were, those representations. In fact, Descartes argues, you don't really have those properties. The color is simply the reflection, reflection of light on my optic nerve. You really don't have a color, right? Your odor is, again, simply a physical analog in my sense apparatus of whatever uh, chemical processes are occurring within you. So the processes that, after this, other philosophers will have to deal with is how do we know our ideas accurately represent a world around us? And we're going to see that there are fundamentally two different ways of approaching this problem. One is the Cartesian rationalistic way. There must be something within ideas themselves which mark out their truth, clarity and distinction. What we'll see in a few lectures down the road will be that there is another tradition which emerges and attempts to deal with this problem and that's called empiricism and it says you can't examine that veil of ideas in and of itself what you have to ask is what do the senses represent how do the senses work and from that you recursively prove what must exist rather than uh, in and of itself examining those representations so in conclusion then, I would stress that Descartes is not only the father of modern philosophy, not only the father of our, of our con present conception of ourselves as minds, mental entities, but is in fact the founder of the modern problematic, the modern technique, the modern quest for certainty. No longer will we be satisfied with merely probable arguments. No longer will we simply speculate about metaphysics. We must now prove metaphysics with the same clarity of science. And in conclusion, I would point out one important characteristic of this. 
One of the fields of philosophy at the time was called the philosophy of nature. The fruits of such philosophic research in the philosophy of nature, and in addition to the philosophy of man, uh, is something called Galilean science, Newtonian science. We call that science. At the time, it was called natural philosophy. Therefore, what I'm arguing is that the modern scientific tradition is closely intertwined with that of philosophical speculation, and it all begins in the, in the 17th century with René Descartes.